so uh, the to title for my talk is uh, the conservation initiatives uh, in india and also the uh, approach of integrated coastal zone management because we have finished a, a decade now of the first phase of icdmp and we are going to uh, uh, go into the second phase of icdmp so i will uh, restrict my talk on uh, to the conservation part only of the entire integrated coastal zone management because it's a huge project and uh, there a lot of intervention that, have, that has been done so my restriction will be uh, very specifically to uh, the conservation uh, activities so in the first phase ncsm itself is part of the entire icdmp program there was a, there was a need of having an institution that can look into coastal issues uh, minister of environment and forest being the legal entity of uh, maintaining the coastal area especially the crz area the coastal regulation zone so there was a need of an institution to take up r and d activities and uh, ncsm was created and uh, from 2013 uh, there is full fledged staff and uh, we see a lot of activities uh, happening and among the major activities is that the first thing that happened was the demarcation of hazard line where uh, 78000 square kilometers of mainland coast of india was mapped using aerial photography which are uh, highly sensitive images and uh, even uh, it is only shared by three institutions the uh, defense the defense ministry the Survey of India and NCSCM. We have a separate, uh, you know, place to stay, store the data, and we have a mini data center to uh, keep the data very intact and safe. And based on these uh, aerial photographs, we were able to cover an area of fifty-six thousand six hundred sixty-one kilometer of the Indian entire Indian coastline. And the second uh, important exercise that happened in the ICDM activity, as a national perspective, was the demarcation of uh, coastal sediment cells. Uh, we the study revealed that there are 26 sediment cells of which 10 are on the west coast 16 are on the east coast it is further divided into primary cells secondary cells and uh, small management units and uh, these sediment cell boundaries uh, give an idea or these were the you know basic uh, framework from which the coastal stretches of development of icdmp were planned and the third important activity was the delineation of ecologically sensitive areas Uh, uh especially in the esa uh, we call them esa and uh, they are uh, as per the crs 2019 the latest notification and uh, we were able to map 34127 uh, square kilometer of esa now the importance of the hazard line and the eco sensitive areas that if you take any state in the country these have been accepted by the state after the state had done a lot of uh, uh, you know uh, exercises with us consultations with us and then it was with the stakeholders it was posted on the website and there were district level uh, uh, you know kind of uh, uh, stakeholder meetings where the areas which were the community said this is not right it was corrected and then it was finally approved by the state so the ultimate product from these activities is the uh, integrating them into the integrated coastal zone management plan which is every state runs and uh, there is a dedicated spmu or a state project monitoring unit that takes care of all these uh, izmp activities and for certain uh, uh, states like gujarat west bengal odisha which were the part one or the phase one you see that different other active uh, different other mechanisms are there so i will be uh, looking more into the conservation uh, angle as i in informed you earlier and here now we are we have metamorphosed or transformed an area where we are now trying to use science uh, to drive policy and law and uh, science we require mainly because when you talk on conservation so on the biodiversity we talk about an ecosystem or a habitat or a niche we have to know what kind of species are there what kind of interactions take place how an organism connects to the habitat how the habitat connects to the system and how the system connects to the biome so there's a lot of uh, uh, r and d that is required and that's where scientists are now uh, you know uh, called for to come together and plan uh, uniform platforms uniform methodology so that we can have good science coming out of it which can lead to a policy which can lead to a betterment of a country or a particular continent and we have taxonomy in that we have ecology in that so it is not just a single component that feeds into the entire science research but it's a, a you know complex network of uh, uh, research uh, uh, elements that gives value to the uh, science part so we do have a lot of policies uh, i've listed a lot of policies here and uh, we do have lots of laws and regulations uh, starting with the wildlife protection act 1972 the epa and uh, the bda act and so on and uh, we do have good uh, uh, laws good good policies but how effective it is while implementing is a big question mark some places has been very effective some places we see there is a lot of intervention required so when we divide them if we take for example the wildlife protection act 
we can divide into two categories based on the spatial conservation and uh, based on species conservation. So based on area, it is now divided into a national park or a sanctuary or a community reserve or a conservation reserve or even, even you know, a, a, a marine national park and so on. Whereas in a species, for example, to conserve a species, you have to bring into the, uh, we have to refer to the Wildlife Protection Act of 1972, which has got four schedules. Uh, based on the schedule one, it means that's a high priority, high conservation, high protection required. And four, it's probably, you know, entering into some kind of an, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, population uh, diminishing kind of a scenario happening in the wild. And then in the Environmental Protect Act 1986, we see there's been a lot of uh, attempts done earlier also. We had the environmentally sensitive zones or ecological sensitive zones. We have environmentally sensitive areas and uh, ecological focus areas. Then we had the wetlands uh, conservation management rules. But ultimately in 2011, there came the CRZ 2011 notification, which said, which brought in the CRZ uh, and ICRZ uh, uh, notifications where it talks very clearly about the ecologically sensitive areas of which I'm going to introduce to in a, a next slide. And then based on the BD Act, we see that biodiversity heritage sites were of important conservation requirements and also the regulatory provisions and institutional mechanisms for conservation, like for example, access to benefit sharing and uh, you know, these kind of uh, uh, you know, important uh, uh, initiatives are taken. And uh, that's how the entire system works is, uh, uh, given a focus of conservation in our country. So I'm just taking now uh, into the CRZ, uh, 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 CRZ notification of 2019, which is the latest one. And uh, not much of changes have been done to the uh, ecological sensitive areas. We call it A to K. There are about uh, four ecosystems, mangroves, coral reefs, sand dunes, mudflats. Then we have the protected areas, which covers the reserve forests, biosphere reserves, national parks, sanctuaries, community reserves all together. Then we have uh, habitats like, you know, uh, turtle nesting grounds, horse to grab habitats and uh, bird nesting grounds. And then we have the uh, archeological and heritage, heritage sites. So basically it's divided into ecosystems, uh, geomorphological features where sand dunes and mud flats uh, come into play, then the habitats and the uh, places of archeological and heritage importance. So, at the end of, uh, we started the exercise in 2013, uh, full-fledged, and uh, by 2018, we were able to complete the entire mapping exercise. Of course, this is not uh, just NCCM, there's a lot of other agencies which have, which have involved corals, for example, uh, many places, NCCM did by itself, then we had ZSI uh, contribute to Andaman Nicobar and DST in Luxury Islands, Seagrass is done by us, Salt Marsh again was done by us, Mangroves are done with CMFRI, with uh, Fisheries College, CAFE, and so many other uh, institutions. Then likewise, we had for every important uh, ecological sensitive area, uh, institution identified uh, certain things we were able to do by ourselves. So the output was that, as I mentioned earlier, we were able to map 34,127 square kilometer and uh, uh, we were able to you know, also map 16,000 hectare of mangrove plantation, 2,000 hectares of shelter belt restoration. Shelter belt here is 90% <clears throat> of it is casuarina then followed by cashew or neem or uh, pongamia or any other kind of uh, vegetation that's found in the most, most of the coastal states. Then 1,200 uh, square meter uh, coral transplantation that happened in the Gulf of Manar, coral gardening that's happening in Lakshadweep and a few pockets in uh, Andaman Nicobar Islands and then Gulf of Kutch. Besides the CRSA 2019 notification the ESA, there's something called a CVCA. This is the critically vulnerable coastal areas. And uh, the notification itself tells very clearly of 12 areas and this is how it's distributed throughout the uh, throughout our nation. And uh, you see that, uh, you know, there are two in found in uh, Andhra, two in Maharashtra and two in Karnataka, uh, keeping in mind the uh, mangroves. These uh, uh, critically vulnerable coastal areas are mangrove uh, inhabited areas, but then we do have corals in Gulf of Manda and also in Gulf of uh, Kutch. So it's a combination of uh, the big areas which, are, which require immediate attention which require the participation of the community. So the critically vulnerable coastal area has to have an integrated management plan. And this integrated management plan will be prepared by NCSM along with the state. And this will take place in the second phase where uh, we are waiting for the second phase of funding to come from the World Bank. So that was the national level. Now, uh, if you see the state level, uh, in the phase one part of IZM, there were three stretches identified, three states that were identified. Gulf of Kutch in uh, Gujarat, uh, Diga Shankarpur and Sagar Island stretch in uh, West Bengal, two, two, two areas, and in Odisha, Paradip to Damara and Gopalpur to Chilika. So I will just tell a little bit of uh, success that happened during this project from 2010-11 uh, onwards. 
uh, till 2020 uh, June when the project has come has come to an end of phase one, and uh, I will just hit upon all the conservation uh, uh, success stories. So in Gujarat, for example, uh, there was an experiment tried uh, with the help of WTA and with the ZSI. Uh, coral transplantation took place in Puratan Island in the Gulf of Kutch, and uh, good to know that the survival rate is really good, 77.57 percent. Because uh, keeping in mind the high turbidity that you have in Gulf of Kutch, the heavy sedimentation that is there. Uh, uh, corals to grow, it's a big challenge, but still the branching corals have uh, survived and uh, they're doing really well. And uh, they were the first to develop the coral atlas for the Gulf of Kutch. So it was an interesting coral atlas where they mapped the areas and they're given the species based information. And of course, all of us know that uh, they were the Gujarat state ranks one among uh, the number of mangrove plantation in terms of area, spatial cover. They have done to 5,200 hectares of mangrove plantation following the traditional mount type, usually you see that there is uh, the fishbone type or the box type or any other kind of uh, uh, technique technique involved in uh, planting mangroves. But here they had followed the traditional uh, process of mound technique. And uh, here the community was involved in large scale to do the plantation. And uh, it was a single plantation like using Avicenia Marina to plant in 80% of the plantations. And it has been very successful. And uh, 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 Mohanser was telling about the economic evaluation. Lots of activity have started very recently. So they have done, uh, Gujarat has done the economic evaluation for coral reefs in the Gulf of Kutch region to be 2,200 million approximate uh, evaluation. And uh, it's, it's expected to provide the benefit of, of 7.9 million Indian rupees. So this is the evaluation available with the Gujarat state government with the Gujarat Ecology Commission, who is the nodal agency for implementation of ICMP projects in the state of Gujarat. And uh, NCSM also started evaluating the goods and services of uh, most of the ecosystems, the ESS, which I explained to you, which is available in the CRZ notification. And uh, we have probably, we will be able to come out with the results in maybe six or seven months for the 11 ecosystems that we have studied. And of course, they have built a uh, uh, sewage treatment plant, the, one of the biggest in the country, with a 70 million liter de de per day capacity of release to make sure that uh, Jamnagar entire town and from nearby districts of water which is coming in does not pollute the coral area. And we are there, they're trying to, uh, you know, uh, make sure that minimal impact is there in this sensitive ecosystems in uh, uh, the Gulf of Kutch. And uh, this is done with the PPP mode, uh, private, uh, uh, private uh, public partnership mode. And uh, there's a lot of uh, learnings from this in, uh, you know, from NICMP. In case of Odisha, we see that uh, a lot of mangrove plantation also happened, but not to the tune of uh, 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 Gujarat, mainly because uh, Gujarat has got a lot of area, huge uh, mudflat areas and the plantation has happened there, but there is a little bit of difference of opinion, which I'll come a little later, in terms of plantation on mudflats. Uh, in, in Odisha, you see that 200 hectares have been uh, planted and uh, uh, you know, there is, you, we all know that Gahir Mada is the world's uh, uh, largest uh, uh, turtle rookery, also called as the Aribada, where uh, this year we have had more close to six to seven lakhs of uh, olive leaves coming to nest in the shores of Gahir Mada and Rushikulia. And uh, the entire community, the, the, the mating happens in the seas and uh, then the females come to the shore to lay eggs. So there is a fish, seven month fishing ban and during the seven month fishing, the, the, the fishermen are <clears throat> not have any uh, livelihood. So this was again done with a lot of uh, stakeholder consultation, compensation was worked out and now the fishermen have agreed and uh, it's, it's going very smooth with the fishermen and the forest department and we see that uh, lots of, uh, you know, bonding between the uh, regulating department and the livelihood, uh, people who depend on livelihood to come together and protect this important uh, olive release. And there's been a lot of uh, ecotourism activity where the fishermen community itself have identified the people who have the capacity to be as nature guides, they've trained them and they go out for uh, the sighting of Iravani dolphin or the migratory birds that come to Chilika. And uh, this has again been a success story. And also the continuation of the uh, program on the conservation of saltwater crocodiles, uh, crocodiles, crocodiles porosis, uh, also very uh, commonly called the salties. From 93, 1975, when the initiation started with the funding of FAO and other uh, uh, big uh, funders, you see that in the last 10 years, there's an increase to 1,768 in 2020, including six albino crocodiles, which is very rare to see. And probably this is one of the places in the entire uh, Southeast Asia that you see that this kind of a solid population of crocodiles and the place I'm talking about the Bitterkaneka uh, forest area. 
The third important uh, state that the first phase of ICM happened was in West Bengal. It happened in two stretches, the <clears throat> Diga Shankarpur coast and the Sagar Island. And uh, most important uh, uh, intervention was that electrification. The island did not have electrification, and they were using they were burning uh, fossil fuels like diesel for you know run the generators. <clears throat> and once the electrification came, then you, there was a lot of livelihood enhancement in terms of education, in terms of livelihood. You know, they were able to run their motors for their agricultural field. Instead of using the traditional methods of pumping water by pulling it, then there's a lot of mangrove plantation initiatives and lively initiatives that took place. And uh, in the Diga Shankarpur coast, we see that uh, the, there was a ZSI marine aquarium which is now updated for uh, ecotourism activities. There's again mangrove plantation that has gone to take place, and shelter belt have been uh, you know uh, uh, planted in many places. And for a change now from the regular uh, plantation of casuarina, it's now shifted to uh, shelter belt plantation, including mangroves. We call them as green coastal infrastructure. So that is the uh, three important. Uh, uh, these three states were part of the phase one of ICMP, and these uh, some of the highlights of conservation uh, success that we have seen in this uh, three states. But I will go a little deeper deep detail into the West Bengal state because uh, for West Bengal state, uh, NCSM was the agency that did the entire planning uh, based on different uh, you know management and different uh, aspects of uh, uh, you know. Different uh, sectors like you know uh, disaster, like livelihood, like uh, uh, you know uh, uh, pollution and so on. So uh, NCSM was given the task in 2017 to prepare the plan for 2017-18 uh, uh, to prepare the plan for ICMP plan for West Bengal, and we did for the both the stretch plan, uh, stretch areas, uh, Diga Shankarpur stretch and the entire Sagar Island. So <clears throat> the outcome of the project was that we were able to prepare 19 reports that included eight management sub plans, each for both the uh, both the uh, plan areas, and uh, we did a marine spatial planning for the entire stretch from Diga Shankarpur to Sagar Island, and uh, we also had <clears throat> incorporated along with the, the Blue Economy initiatives, uh, current initiatives, and what we can probably foresee, because you know that uh, Sagar Island is exactly on the route of the Ganges River meeting the ocean, and Bay of Bengal and uh, the Hooghly uh, River, you uh, know the Hooghly area, which is very important, and uh, the ports which are there, plenty of ports which are there, and the kind of Ship traffic that is there, <clears throat> and is one of the important uh, river-based, uh, you know, uh, shipping route that you see in the country. So, the plans were prepared with 175, uh, you know, uh, different uh, various parameters using different parameters, including you know, physical, chemical, oceanographic, biological, and social parameters. <clears throat> A lot of field surveys were carried out as primary, and then we were able to take also secondary assessments and second data to uh, validate uh, what we have seen in the field and what was already there published in the different reports. And uh, as most of you have discussed in the previous uh, lectures and also in, in the question answer discussion period, the involvement of stakeholders is very important. So we had uh, close to 22 uh, stakeholder consultation meetings, uh, starting from uh, the higher range, chief secretary range to the uh, principal secretary of forest range and then to the uh, site range where we had consultation meetings in Diga and also in Sagar Island, where community was involved, where village leaders were involved. And uh, we were surprised to see some, whatever uh, results we were able to get in the field of second data, were totally different to what community has said. So we had to incorporate everything in our minutes and was added and given to the government. And I'm happy to say that uh, before the lockdown, the pro process started. And uh, recently we come to know in October, we came to know in October that the plans have been accepted by the state government. You know, uh, West Bengal state is very, uh, very systematic in keeping their documents and they do a lot of analysis before they pass any you know, kind of a, a bill or pass any kind of given okay. So it took a lot of time for us, but then we were able to successfully finish the work. So I will now uh, uh, try and uh, tell you in a very short time how uh, we had gone ahead with the conservation management plan, what and all we did, and uh, what made them to understand that these are very important, uh, what has to be protected, what has to be conserved, how the community has to be involved, and so on. So I'm giving the example of one plan area with Sagar Island, and uh, I will just uh, try to uh, complete that as early as possible. So this is a uh, map of Sagar Island. You see from the Indian map. Uh, this is the, uh, if you can see my cursor, this is the entire Sagar Island, and the island which is uh, <clears throat> very, very, uh, you know, prone to impact from climate change. There's a lot of erosion that's happening on the banks. Many places have, you know, gone underwater. Southern side, especially the Ganga Sagar, Sipu, but this is all now inundated. The entire village has moved northwards. And there's a lot of uh, problem because the uh, the area is aligned now. It's unfit for agriculture, and there's a lot of other pressures also. And uh, Sagar is the 
uh, resource area six in terms of critically vulnerable coastal area. There are six resource areas in Sundarbans. So this is the last part of the area, RA6 we call it. And this is the place where you see uh, a population of close to two lakh plus based on 2011 census survive. <clears throat> the entire island is very important because the Ganga Sagar Mela happens where lakhs and lakhs of people come to the island just for a very, very short period. So you can imagine the kind of uh, pollution that generates, uh, solid waste that generates, liquid waste that generates, the air pollution that happens. But then it is a very, very religiously and uh, mythologically important area for pilgrimage. So now the government has tried its best efforts to do uh, the uh, uh, maintaining, uh, giving the proper management, uh, you know, uh, for solid waste, for liquid waste and so on. But uh, the carrying capacity has also been uh, being worked out for this particular area. <clears throat> so this is how we started the, before we went to the field, this, this was our idea. This, we wanted to have a clear blueprint before we went to uh, take up this issue. So we, we, uh, all of us know that mapping is the most important strength that all of us have. Without maps, it's very difficult for us to go to a field to do the ground routing. So of course, maps cannot tell the minute uh, you know, details, but then with a the map, you will know the spatial cover and we'll be able to exactly frame on what we are looking at, what elements are you going to focus on, what areas of interventions uh, are we going to suggest based on the ground routing that we do. So we see these, the mapping part is one, second was uh, biodiversity. So all put together assessment, we have the uh, planning happening. So on, on, on the presentation at the left side, you see this is called a PCR. This is a participatory coastal resource assessment where we involve the community in different villages to come forward and tell the entire history of their place where they're living, what kind of reserves they're access to. We'll show them pictures of mangroves, coral, seagrass, everything is there, whatever they say, yes, we see it there. Then we mark it and then we happen, how was it then, how was it now? So it was a <coughs> very, uh, uh, it was a very uh, interesting exercise where the community comes forward and tells you about uh, you know, what is there in their particular area. So we did a PCRA and we also did a little bit of goods and services uh, for this particular evaluating how much of uh, 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 value of mangroves, corals, uh, mangroves, sorry, mangroves and uh, salt marsh and uh, other ESAs have in Sagar Island. Of course, the goods and services part is not reflecting here. It belongs to the social science department. So I've not uh, you know, brought in that aspect here, but I'd be happy to share like, what is there. And uh, then we prepared the draft CMP and then we had the stakeholder consultation in different places and then the conservation management was submitted and then it was approved. So this is the approach that we do uh, for the preparation CMP. We do the resource mapping and then we do the resource analysis. Then we see the trend in condition. What happens? How was it earlier? How was it now? This we can pick up cues from publications, from what we see in the site and also from the community and from managers who can give a lot of idea about what's there. Then we identify the conservation gaps and then we go out with the plan to tell what can be done. So this is the mapping you see. This is the Sagar Island and uh, the locations of different ecological sensitive areas. And you see that uh, values are given in, for example, if I, if I say in Sagar Island, how much mangroves we have? As per 2019, based on the maps, we have 11.1 .1 square kilometer. How much salt marsh? 0.35. Like that, we have completely <clears throat> mapped the entire area of different ecological sensitive areas. You know, please remember, there's not the entire resource. It's only the ecologically sensitive areas based on the CRS 2019 notification. So we were also able to do a lot of documentation on the biodiversity. We were able to document more than 1,000 species reported. And we were able to also document some species where we did our primary surveys in the field. So you see on the left side, it gives you the uh, complete group from the microscopic to macroscopic. Uh, what are the plant animal species there? The detailed checklists are available in the management plan where it goes to the next. And then we also have listed all the major threats, like for example, fishery operation, habitat degradation, poaching, invasion of alien species, tourism, chemical pollution. Chemical pollution here, I mean that you know uh, the there are uh, so, uh, uh, salt fish or the dry fish is very popular there, and very especially the tritures, the ribbon fishes, and also the uh, the Bombay duck, harbored on for a season of three months, are uh, very important dry fish that is there. So uh, the salt, uh, the hypersaline water is discharged in the mangrove area and you can see stunted mangrove growths very close to channels. And also uh, sometimes there is also use of formalin to make sure that the food product is not uh, degraded very fast or decomposing very fast. And then it's sent to markets outside the state. And then of course we have also have the climate change angle. And of course the sustaining part I'll, I'll come, I'll present in the next few slides. So in the survey, we also found out that with the secondary data, 
and with uh, consultation with uh, organizations like WWF and so on, no, they, they published work. Uh, based on IUCN in categories, we there were 12 threatened, near threatened species, four vulnerable, four endangered, and two critically endangered species. The two, uh, critically endangered species also includes the uh, national uh, aquatic animal, the Ganges dolphin, which is uh, freshwater in, uh, in nature. It can be tracked up to Uttar Pradesh, and but it comes up to Sagar Island. That's the best part. It comes up to Sagar Island when the salinity comes down during the monsoon season. And there are also case studies where they've seen that they migrate to uh, Bangladesh and again come back. That's very interesting, but again, it's a big study, so we didn't take much into it. And uh, this uh, image of the map tells you the location of the sacred groves. Sacred groves are very, very important biodiversity spots in an area. And the entire country is uh, filled with sacred groves. And, uh, and Sagar also, we have close to uh, six or seven uh, sacred groves that are uh, discovered. And we found a lot of uh, uh, the sacred groves itself in Sagar Island, for example, when we, we spoke with the local community, some of the water, uh, you know, canals or, or water uh, ponds were dug by Britishers to make sure that they have fresh water. The near future, uh, future days where they they expected some kind of uh, calamity can happen. Please remember, Sagar is prone to cyclone. Whenever cyclone passes uh, West Bengal, if it's hitting West Bengal, definitely hitting Sagar. This a uh, prone to cyclone. So there are ways by which you know they try to uh, store water the way they try to store protect their own resources that they are cultivating and so on. So. This is the sacred groves. And uh, this is exactly a map that tells you the entire location of mangroves uh, found in the uh, total uh, Sagar Island. And uh, on the north, you see here, I'm just moving my cursor there in this place. A lot of, uh, it is an eroding area, but uh, interestingly, when the Sundarban Development Board had uh, uh, thrown seeds from helicopters in this area, they have all captured well, they have settled well, and they started to grow. And again, southern side also, you see that on the south uh, eastern side, a lot of mangrove plantation initiatives that have taken place. And uh, we see that a lot of uh, species diversity also, not like the original Sindarpon uh, core area, <clears throat> but good distribution of uh, 11 to 12 species that you find uh, in the mangrove area. So this is the entire map of uh, uh, Sagar with mangroves. So like that, we prepare maps for every individual uh, equal sensitive area. Now, this is the distribution of sand dunes. And uh, uh, here, a small variation is there because it is, uh, we have uh, the map, uh, the initial map showed us that the dunes, but then we found out there were no dunes, it was just mud flats, but mounds were there. And uh, the entire, uh, uh, the western side, you see, there's a lot of uh, buns. And uh, these buns are uh, just to protect the uh, flood water to come inside during storm time. Earlier days, they were just mud banks, which were, you know, made of all mud, but now there are concrete uh, banks that are made protecting the, community from getting, uh, you know, uh, affected by cyclones or any other storm surges. And see, the mudflats, these are activities that go on there. The mudflats are actually, uh, earlier mudflats historically have been already uh, uh, gone, they've gone because uh, unscientific plantation of cashew has taken place right on the mud, uh, on the sand dunes, sorry, sand dunes. And uh, these sand dunes have been affected very badly. And we have only very small dunes remaining and these sand dunes are right now used as a fishing space. So, there is now uh, an awareness that is creation that is required. If you use the fishing space, then the chance of the sand dune vegetation to settle down and to uh, pro uh, convert them from embryo to you know good dunes is uh, is missing. So there is a lot of consultation that is going on from the state government to make sure that the fishing community understands this and alternate spaces where the dunes are not there can are identified by the state government to uh, share with the fishing people uh, the fishing community so that their fishing space is not, uh, or their fishing area is not disrupted. At the same time, they also will be able to do some, something for the environment. And this is the mudflat Sagar Island. See the entire uh, west coast. Uh, it's got a big stretch of mudflats and the images you can see how it, uh, how, uh, you know, long they are. Of course, it is uh, nothing in comparison to the mudflats that we have in the west coast, in Gujarat especially. But still, uh, this is a uh, again large stretch, and uh, these are excellent areas for the red ghost crabs, uh, also called Microsaurus. So we see them as certain beaches in West Bengal are called red crab beaches, like in uh, places uh, places in the Diga Shankarpur area, where you see you know uh, lakhs and lakhs of uh, uh, you know uh, crabs running around. The entire beach will be found to be in red red in color. And uh, this, again, interestingly, this is uh, the West Bengal, uh, uh, Odisha, and uh, the north of Andhra Pradesh are the only sites in India where we have the horseshoe crabs. There are two species, Carcinocopus rodenticordatus and Tachypilus tridentatus. Both of the species are available in Sagar Island. Uh, 
uh, of course one species is not you know cited very rarely and uh, interestingly in the sagar island you can see them in mangrove areas in better can you can see the mangrove areas but in diga shankarpur mainland of uh, west bengal coast you can see them in the beach you can see dead carapaces of them in the beach and of course these horseshoe crabs are not, not actually real crabs they have come in the arachnid or the scorpion group because of the jointed legs and because of the scorpion like arrangement in their body and this is a very important uh, crab that is used in medical uh, examination it's uh, uh, the, the blood is blue in color you uh, know hemocyanin so it the blue blood is useful for lots and lots of uh, medical research you know in the us it's an it's an uh, uh, permitted activity whereas in india it is protected in schedule 4 of the wildlife protection act but even today we see that traditionally it has been used for you know uh, a traditional medicine for you know back pain and so on they take out and they boil it and take out the oil from it and then they are using for uh, various purposes but this is a very important place where uh, you know uh, they live and thrive well and this again about the mineral deposits available in the entire uh, sagar island and i will not spend much time on this so having done all these basic exercises having our maps ready then we went to the core issues what was actually the major issues in sagar island that might directly impact the csas and also the livelihood so we found that uh, habitat loss again both anthropogenic and also uh, uh, climate change erosion happening on the eastern and western sides then uh, mangrove areas being converted into aquaculture you know and uh, <coughs> we also seen that uh, certain places uh, salt marsh have been uh, uh, you know, cut in such a level that you know the water can come inside and uh, we also in over exploitation some gears which they used are not uh, very eco friendly for example there is a when the demand in the aquaculture market goes up there is a drag net used by women just walking on the shore and these drag nets collect a lot of shrimp seeds and these shrimp seeds are collected and taken live to the aquaculture ponds basically the aquaculture uh, 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 entrepreneurs do not uh, buy seeds from outside and uh, they are able to just uh, ask the fishermen to give and it sold at just a uh, you know one rupee per uh, uh, shrimp seed size or 50 paisa per like that's the kind of count that's given so the entire mudflat area is disturbed so when this mudflat area is disturbed automatically the birds that come to the mudflat migratory birds and also the residential birds that are there when they start to move away then the dropping of guano or the bird droppings uh, which enriches the entire coastal belt is you know is restricted and we also in poaching poaching for example as i told you the horseshoe crab is uh, being uh, poached now though there is a lot of strike we have seen sometimes even turtles being caught for meat so a lot of awareness and capacity building is happening within the community through uh, the biodiversity management committee through the nba scheme we also seen habitat displacement taking place some of them have moved out we have seen pollution as i told you you know uh, the even the uh, the solid waste liquid waste now through not just through the <coughs> religious tourism but also through the you know the people who live there also impacts the environment there's a severe conflict between man and human uh, man and animal uh, which is the uh, human beings uh, and the uh, uh, fishing cats now fishing cat is the state animal uh, uh, surprising state animal of west bengal but then there's a lot of conflict between a man and fishing cats because fishing cats are always considered or seen as the small form a uh, uh, tiger cub uh, you know santu sundarban area it's the uh, only place in the world where you see that you know mangroves and tigers living together and uh, we see also that fishing cats mimic the tigers in a smaller but they are very small in size and there's a lot of killing that's happening there are severe encroachments that have taken place and also surprisingly we have seen that invasive species especially in the freshwater uh, you know ponds and tanks in uh, in west bengal every house has got a back backyard <coughs> farm and every house has got a backyard pond where they culture their own fish species and we have seen rupchanda a common name which is the paku or the uh, mimic of pirana which is found to grow there in plenty at least not indian species south american and uh, you know it's now uh, uh, spreading badly so this is the uh, the pcra which i explained to you the participatory coastal resource assessment where you invoke the community and they map their areas they map their village and they tell you what resources were there they will give you a time timeline of including cyclones what happened how people migrated because of a famine how diseases completely you know brought down the population what animals they had fight fight with and so on okay it was a big list but i have just given you a glimpse or a birds eye view about how this pcr access access happens and here we see that women are more involved men they give traditional knowledge of the sea but women give the traditional knowledge of what's available in the in the land or the uh, the island part so this is just a small uh, uh, snapshot of what findings we get from the pcra 
like they tell about mangrove laws how would happen and then they said who went and uh, you know planted and who went along with them then they also say something very interesting the salt marsh though it is uh, not much studied in detail we see that they are used in the local market for cooking in tamil nadu also it's being used uh, they eat it along with shrimp they call umari kiri in tamil so it is there it's used as cattle feed it's good for mulching and uh, and there is also historically a uh, uh, time when they used to use salt marsh for catching it almost like an fad to trap these crabs in uh, you know in in the shallow waters and then uh, the community still comes and tells what is the problem with there they said trawling close to shore has resulted you know that always there is a, a kind of a conflict between the uh, traditional artisanal fishers and the deep sea fishers there's a lot of problem happening then uh, we seen that how the demand for aquaculture is now uh, converting the agriculture land into brackish water but interestingly we see that this sagar island has got a typical uh, uh, crop a salt tolerant halo 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 fine crop rice crop that is used which is very very long growing and it will just fall down very interesting to see that so now even these areas have been slowly getting converted into aquaculture ponds mainly because aquaculture is now you know it's like a lottery ticket and you know if if you hit it then you hit full swing but if you lose because of uh, disease or something else then it's a complete loss then erosion then they are also told how different fish species have declined very interesting to spend time with the uh, people especially the seniors uh, you know who are 78 years who have hands on experience of going to the ocean fishing in the uh, island waters fishing in the, in the river and waters uh, they are they struggle to storms but they give you a complete uh, information about what has gone up what has come down and interestingly when we corroborate the information with what fishery statistics we have from the state of the same of our right and then we see uh, there's a lot of you know uh, closeness of what they say and uh, now the only request islanders have is the connection of bridge it's going to definitely have an impact on the environment but then it is a uh, Uh, it's a long dream for them and uh, i i think it's almost through with the state government to build a connection between the kakudweep and to the sagar island so i will not uh, uh, spend more time on this uh, uh, for every ecological sensitive area or the conservation angle we have found out what are the extent available what are the problems that are there what interventions have taken in the past and we have suggested what intervention can happen in the future so this is the mangroves mud flats and sand dunes and then for horseshoe crab and uh, one important uh, aspect is the hilsa fish you know that uh, there is no uh, festival there is no ritual in west bengal without hilsa and uh, and this particular fish hilsa elisha is so very expensive in west bengal and uh, you know there is already a hilsa research center that is located in the mainland but in the island also there is a we have suggested that there can be a research center where which can cater to the hilsa fish uh, hilsa catch the uh, you know statistics and you know document how much of uh, landing takes place in the island itself and uh, in terms of minerals the only powerful mineral is sand because everything has to come from mainland now it's only by uh, uh, boat movement now from you know the ferries which ferry you from uh, kakudi port to uh, to sagar island uh, boat jetty so at the moment we don't have any big vehicles uh, or transportation is a big issue uh, as i told you the bridge is going to connect in the future but then now sand everything expensive coming from the mainland so illegal <clears throat> sand mining happened but now it's all under check so we have suggested the enforcement should be there proper enforcement should be there so the vision is that now this is a broader vision here though it is a conservation angle the broader vision is that livelihood should be prop, uh, you know it should, should not be tampered much because of st strict conservation policies it is you cannot say the fishermen you cannot take you cannot do that but involve the fishermen to take what is best to check on stocks and also to Uh, participate handhold with them ask them to participate and carry out all the program participatory although the already the mangrove plantation has been a good excess where we see that lot of participatory mangrove plantation activities have taken place but then it has to slowly happen with others and as uh, informed or as we discussed earlier also stakeholders are very very important and uh, it was a learning experience even for us to communicate with the stakeholders from the ground grassroots level to the official level we were able to talk to all the different stakeholders and then a common stakeholder meeting where they were able to voice out what they need what is missing and so on and we were able to incorporate everything in the plan so i will not uh, uh, go very detail into it so from the sagar island we found the needs where for one was uh, strengthening of the biodiversity management committee and uh, one was the to under common based mangrove management because two things the mangrove plant is also acts as a bio shield against cyclones and place where erosion is happening so that is one thing 
Then again, mudflats sand is very important because these uh, mudflats are the places where which the plankton productivity uh, nutrients are supplied to the coastal waters. And sand dunes again, they are also acting as very important, uh, uh, you know, freshwater reserves. They maintain the uh, groundwater table, and uh, the vegetation there protects sand from erosion. So there's a lot of other things happening, and such as the hills are conservation as the centers uh, branch to be started there in the island and conserving freshwater wetland in islands because. The uh, freshwater wetlands right now are all purely depend upon the uh, rains, and uh, since the cap water holding capacity is good, uh, the, they live there. But lots of eutrophication we have seen most of the uh, water bodies because uh, there is no proper, you know, liquid uh, waste management system available. <clears throat> there is no proper riparian system available because a riparian buffer, uh, two three places there, uh, which is very good. But then uh, we have suggested that good riparian buffer should be planted. You know, most close to the uh, canals or to the places where the water is being let out, and.